As part of the global climate strike, uh, about 25,000 uh, students marched through the centre of Dublin city. This was in fact only one of many demonstrations that was taking place around Ireland. Even the uh, small dormitory towns around Dublin like Maynooth had their own demonstration. So the actual numbers protesting in Ireland were probably in the region of 40,000. The video you're watching here is the entirety of the Dublin March passing. Uh, one of the things that strikes you, apart from the age, of course, of all those participating, is all the handwritten signs uh, that certainly indicate quite an awareness of what the issue actually is. We've seen an awful lot of cranky old white men in the Irish media over the last couple of weeks uh, trying to suggest that uh, the young people taking part in these mass protests don't understand the issues or are being foolish or whatever else. Um, and I think one of the most powerful answers to that is just to watch this video and watch all the different signs and different slogans that people have created themselves. The Irish government's complete lack of seriousness about the climate crisis is shown by the fact that the Taoiseach Leo Varadkar uh, chose this of all days to cut the ribbon on a runway being reopened. Uh, air travel, of course, is one of the things people focus in as a major cause of uh, climate uh, change, climate breakdown. Uh, the reason for that is it's, 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 a, it's significant enough if small percentage on its own, but also it's one of those things where a very small number of people are causing a huge amount of damage. Uh, an awful lot of the damage of air travel is not in fact even from the people who are lucky enough to uh, take a family holiday each year by air flight, but in fact from people who are traveling multiple times each year. Uh, six or more times accounts for about, I think, 90% of of the actual damage. That air travel figure is one illustration among many of why it's a mistake to talk about halting climate breakdown in terms of getting people to make different individual consumer choices. In fact, most of the damage is done by a very, very small percentage of the world's population and is done by the world's wealthy. We already know they don't particularly care about the rest of us because they have created an economic system in which a huge percentage of the world's population are extremely poor. So while on the individual level, you or I might decide to try and completely avoid air travel, that makes very, very little difference if in fact you've got a fairly narrow elite that are traveling multiple times per year and who don't change their behavior because frankly, they don't really care that much about how the rest of us live. This also isn't a question of them simply being immoral. That's true, but um, it's more a case that an awful lot of the problems we face need systematic collective change. It can't be changed at an individual level. Very good example of that, in fact, is, is land transport in general. Ireland has a pretty terrible public transport system. It's expensive, uh, it's quite often slow, and it also doesn't really connect areas up very well. It tends to just connect city centres up with the suburbs. Uh, because it's set up to facilitate working and shopping and not actual people's needs to visit each other, for instance. And the national train network is, is both slow and only really connects Dublin to each of the uh, regional cities. It doesn't even really connect them to each other. Uh, so we've created this uh, transport system in Ireland where for a lot of people, they're quite dependent on having a car. Now, we know cars cause a huge amount of damage. So the government's proposed solution to that, which is no solution whatsoever, uh, is to simply try and replace the uh, mechanical petrol and diesel cars on the roads with electric cars. Now, on one level, that is some improvement because obviously emissions from electric cars are lower. Uh, but what it also does is ensure that, in fact, lots and lots and lots of new electric cars need to be built. I think the estimate is currently a million. Um, and the process of constructing those uh, involves the production of a huge amount of additional climate change gases. What we need to do in terms of transport is not an individual consumer choice of what pe sort of car people drive, but rather a collective choice made by society that we're going to have a very good public transport system, one that I think should be free, uh, and one that means people actually Actually don't really need cars anymore. What we need to do is create a collective system where the private car becomes a kind of oddity of the past. You know, that involves very good train systems, extremely good bus systems that 
don't just run into the city centre, but collect uh, districts up readily, collect, p- connect people to shopping centres, uh, connect all those sort of needs that people have in terms of transport that are not just about work. Uh, and then also a rural transport system that enables people to rapidly reach every village on the island. These sort of systems actually already exist in North Africa, for instance, uh, where relative poverty means everybody can't afford a car. So you've got collective taxi systems that connect towns to small villages. Uh, And then technology, of course, also gives us some chance for improvements here because we already have systems of um, cars where you hire by the hour. You can see that expanding out uh, to where there's a a range of different sizes uh, that you can borrow a car that that you need to fill a particular function, whether that's bringing uh, an elderly relative to a hospital perhaps, or uh, going to pick up some new furniture, in which case you need more of a van. This is a completely different idea though, from replacing our current fleet of cars with electric cars. The level of collective decision making we need here extends beyond the type of vehicles but also the transport infrastructure in terms of roads in particular. Uh, Government priority for a very long time has been to prioritise road transport. So we've had a lot of money has gone into building motorway connections uh, between Dublin and the other Uh, cities around Ireland. Now again, we have the problem with Dublin being placed at the centre of that network. Um, But the problem is is also that that has money that has not gone into the train infrastructure, for instance. And it's not even really gone into buses that can use those motorways. In the cities, it's even more extreme in that we've had this long, long period where uh, car driving has been prioritised over every other way of getting around the city, um, and in particular over cycling and over people walking. Uh, in recent years, we've had a bit more of a focus on buses and the creation of the quality bus corridors, and that in its own demonstrates how, if you change the infrastructure, you start to change the methods people actually use. But that needs to be greatly improved in itself, and we need to see a switch that takes cars out of the city centre and prioritises uh, bicycles and public transport and walking over those. And this needs to be extended out to the suburbs and particularly the newer suburbs where when you look at the town plans, they're kind of disastrous. They're all these fast rat runs for uh, cars to make their way from one location to another and very little consideration of both pedestrians and of cyclists. These are not things that are changed by individual consumer choices. One person here or there choosing to cycle rather than getting a car isn't going to change the ease for everybody else of cycling. It needs to be a collective decision. It needs to be a decision we make as a society to prioritise one over the other. So why is it that there's such a big focus on individual consumer choices as a way of combating climate breakdown? Um, Well, One of the reasons is it seems like an easy solution in that it's one we can each make as an individual and that gives us a sense that we're doing something meaningful. And I'd be least inclined to criticise that because I've made changes myself uh, to the way I live uh, and that's because I feel I want to contribute as little as possible to the problem. Uh, I I don't want to be somebody who's accelerating climate change. But I recognise that what I, those choices I make will have very, very little impact, indeed no impact, in terms of where the planet is going to find itself in 10, 20 or 30 years' time. For the reasons I've already outlined, the really meaningful changes have to be changes we make collectively, that we make as a society. But there are other reasons why the individual consumer choice gets pushed. Um, and the main other reason is ideological. We live in a society, a neoliberal society, where the whole idea that society could make, should make decisions is, is looked down on, is seen as stupid, as foolish, as something not to be attempted. Instead, we are told that the market will make decisions and that if we allow the free hand of the market to operate, it will somehow magically make decisions that will fix the climate or that will fix housing, uh, to take an example where it's very obviously not happening in the current Irish context. And you might wonder where does this idea that the market can be a solution come from, in particular when in the context of housing and climate change it very obviously isn't working. 
why is it the case that what we are told are intelligent people, media commentators, exact, etc., continuously put forward this idea that the market can do something that very blatantly isn't? Uh, and the reason for that is basically down to the fundamental nature of the society we live in. Uh, taking a step back and looking at that society, we see that a very small percentage of people control almost all the wealth in that society. And that this control means that while we call the society we live in a democracy, the reality is that in work, for instance, most of us have no say whatsoever in terms of how things go. We've no say over what's produced, why it's produced, uh, how much it's sold for, etc. That's made by the people who own the company. Those people often don't even work for the company we're in. Uh, they're often shareholders. They just collect a, a percentage of the profits made every year because they own those shares. That's quite a strange system. Looking into it further, you realise that what determines things like elections is very, is, is very often media, right? And most of the media is owned by the same very small amount of rich people who own the rest of wealth in society. When you look at the data, in fact, you realise that elections are nearly always won by the candidate who has the most money. That's the main determining factor in who rules us. So... In work, it's the case that we live in what is really a dictatorship. We don't really have a say about how work runs. Uh, and then society as a whole is also run by the same people, effectively. They buy the politicians, sometimes very literally in terms of bribes, uh, sometimes less literally, but still as effectively in terms of what's funded and also the control of the media. So these are the people who are also the ones who are producing the vast majority of climate change gases. They're also the people who control the companies and corporations who produce the vast majority of climate change gases. And they're the people who make the make the profits uh, that these companies uh, generate. They go into their pockets. So you've got a very small percentage of the world's population. We're maybe talking less than 1% here, maybe 0.1%. Um, that get most of the wealth that's generated by this process uh, and who have not that much interest in the effects of climate change. I mean, if you take a very simple, trivial example of rising sea levels, the rich are not that concerned about rising sea levels. They have the money to move. They have the money to buy a house on wherever the beach is going to be at its new sea level. Um, and in fact, they expect to make a lot of money from property speculation around it. The vast majority of the world's poor, on the other hand, don't have any of those choices. In fact, lots of people in some countries are trapped where they cannot escape rising sea levels because they live in, in places that have either low-lying land, as in Pacific Islanders, or in countries like Bangladesh, where there's uh, a lot of rivers, a lot of water already, and adding to those is just flooding what's left of the available land. They, ne they can't necessarily escape the effects of this because they don't have the money to move somewhere else. For a lot of the rest of us, it's not quite that severe, but it is the case that we already can't afford housing, that we're already stuck paying way more rent than what we can actually afford, and that as the, as things get disrupted, as uh, areas go underwater, moving for us is a much bigger deal than it is for other people. Uh, the much more worrying thing that's already happening well ahead of sea level rises is food insecurity. The changing climate means that uh, food crops that were once regularly appearing are appearing less frequently, they sometimes fail, and that's really affecting the poorest people in the world who are very much dependent on subsistence farming for a living. The rest of us, we see food prices increasing, perhaps. Uh, we see we have to switch from eating one thing to another thing, perhaps, as a consequence of that. But a lot of the world's population are dependent on growing their own food, and if the crop fails, they don't necessarily have the means to purchase something else. They become dependent perhaps on UN relief funds uh, and if those fail they literally face threat of starvation. This is already happening across most of the planet. Uh, there are already a lot of people living in food in insecurity, uh, looking at failing crops, looking at stored food diminishing and then becoming dependent on UN or whatever other relief agencies uh, provide food as a result of that. That's the planet we've already created and we have not seen anything like uh, the worst effects of climate change that we think are coming in the next 20 or 30 years. In fact, not think, we know these are coming. And in fact, if you look at the commentary from the angry old white men in the media I referred to earlier about the movement to halt climate uh, breakdown, you'll see that 
these ideas actually come together because what you'll often see is they'll try and rubbish uh, the dedication being shown by the activists who are coming out and organising on the street by suggesting that instead they should be not using their mobile phones or that they sh their parents shouldn't be driving them to school in the morning or that they shouldn't be taking a holiday or a whole range of things that are precisely intended to try and push people away from the collective solutions we need and towards individual consumer choices. So the message that's being put out in the media, and again the media is controlled, owned by the super wealthy, is that instead of taking collective action, and collective action includes this sort of demonstration, instead of collectively organising together, instead of talking about what solutions we need together, what you should do is retreat back into the home, go back to being an individual, go back to making consumer choices. And of course, the reality is, in fact, that the capitalist system is also well capable of making profits out of consumer choices. You know, if lots of people stop eating beef, for instance, because of the uh, very real impact it has on climate, uh, there are a lot of uh, greenhouse gases associated with the production of beef in comparison with other foods. That means we probably collectively need to decide to cut down beef beef production drastically, if not eliminated altogether for a while. Uh, if people start talking about that, or if they stop eating beef as a result of realising this, then they're perfectly happy to provide alternative foods that they can make other profits from to the people who have taken that decision to stop eating it. And on the other hand, they're perfectly happy to continue to provide uh, beef to the rest of the people who haven't made that decision. And what they'll actually do, and what we've seen, is they use their media control to stir up antagonism between those two groups because they know if they can create a fight between vegetarians and meat eaters, uh, then both those groups become distracted by, in fact, the common danger they face and it becomes more difficult for them to organise together. And we've seen a lot of that. I mean, if you look at the commentary underneath all the clickbait articles you'll see in the mainstream press on Facebook or whatever, you'll see that fight being fought out endlessly. You see the same sort of fight being fought out between car drivers and cyclists. And again, this often comes from a media clickbait, you know, a deliberate attempt to sort of set people who aren't really against each other, uh, against each other, uh, when the reality is that the change we need isn't going to be made simply by more people choosing to become cyclists, that's great if they do that, uh, but actually needs to involve a whole reworking of what we understand by transportation. That switch uh, I talked about earlier from individual car culture to collective forms of public transportation, trains in particular, uh, buses, cycling, and uh, collective systems of being able to use cars. Instead of having a discussion about that in the media, however, you never see that idea, in fact, being expressed at all, really. Uh, what you see endlessly is this attempt to set the needs of one group of people against another group of people. So how do we escape this trap? Well, actually, the first answer to that is what we're seeing here in this video. We escape this trap by coming together. We escape this trap by taking it part in collective action. And the march is a start to that sort of process of collective action. It's bringing people together. It's people here are talking to each other while they march. Uh, people are getting a sense of common purpose, but actually the other thing big marches do like this is they give you a sense of power. You realise how many people are thinking the same sort of thing and you realise you have a power together. Uh, there's a, there's a, even a collective sense in the sense that you get in a football or other sports crowd of people being together of a common purpose. So they often provide a very good start point. But I think the thing we've got to be clear about is they're only a start point. You know, back in 2003, when the, the Gulf War happened, uh, ahead of that war, there were absolutely enormous demonstrations all around the world, and in particular in the countries that were heading to war against it. You know, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people came out on the streets and said, we do not want this war. Even in Ireland, Dublin saw a demonstration that was probably four times bigger, uh, perhaps more than four times bigger than this march. At least 100,000 people marched through Dublin and were specifically saying, we don't want to have a part in this war. Uh, and the part that we are being pushed into is refueling American warplanes at Shannon. Uh, 
But the government simply ignored it. In fact, somewhat worse than simply ignoring it, uh, the then Taoiseach Bertie Ahern said he'd have been on the demonstration himself if he wasn't busy. So though they're well used to being able to contain this sort of mass popular protest, it has to go somewhere else. Uh, it has to escalate. And the question we have to think about collectively it is exactly the same as this other process we've been talking about, collectively restructuring society, we need to come together and think about what can we do? What other possibilities exist? How do we force them to pay attention to us? There are a couple of answers to this. And first of all, I'm going to say what I don't think the answer is. And unfortunately, it's the one most people tend to head towards. I don't think the answer is electoral politics. I've already talked about the way that's controlled by the super wealthy. And indeed, in Ireland, uh, we see a very good example in the Irish Green Party of how toothless and useless it is. The Green Party have been in power. They were part of the government back in the mid 2000s. Uh, they were part of the government when there was massive opposition to the opening of a new experimental gas refinery at Rossport. Uh, there were huge uh, community mobilizations against that. People resisted that refinery over the course of a decade. Um, and in fact, the Green Party were there in power at the end of the process. And they saw the deployment of the Irish Navy, two gunboats down there, uh, hundreds of Gardaí uh, and uh, even, in fact, apparently uh, elements of the Irish army. They saw the preventative arrest of activists, completely illegal, the detention of people in Mountjoy jail, in fact, to prevent them protesting the construction of that refinery. And they pushed that through. And before they went into government, they'd actually stood on the opposite side. That's the reality of taking uh, electoral power in Ireland and in other countries, you become the party that implements the bad stuff, no matter what you've said your intentions are around that. So in the immediate sense, what we can do is move from these demonstrations uh, to programs of direct action, where we actually target the industries that are producing most of the greenhouse gases. In the Irish context, for instance, it means if they go give a go ahead for the LNG plant on the Shannon, which will result in the importation of lots of fracking gas, particularly damaging, uh, that we physically put ourselves in the way and stop the construction of that plant. Uh, you can apply the same sort of thing to road projects. People have done this before in the past. We identify things where we ourselves can come together in huge numbers and, and stop those projects going ahead and put pressure on that will force other projects to happen instead. Uh, we can do things that are somewhat more indirect but still quite effective, like bringing cities to a halt. Uh, that's been happening already to an extent, but somewhat on a symbolic level, forcing a change of policy. And in the medium and longer term, we use this process to gain an understanding of our own power, to see that in fact, if we come together, we are perfectly capable of running society and that we want to do it on a very different basis to that very, very tiny percentage that currently run everything. We can take power ourselves, we can collectively come together, we can run our workplaces, we can run our communities, and we can set a very, very different set of priorities than the current system which prioritises profit above all else. It's great to see the huge numbers that have started to mobilise. What we need to think about is what we're going to do with that mobilisation, and the answer is to radically transform society in a revolutionary way.